Hello friends, welcome to the Viva Wars of Anatomy. In today's video, we will discuss about the humerus. Another name of the humerus is a funny bone. This is a typical long bone. So it is having a upper end, shaft and lower end. Now first we see a side determination. So the upper end contain the rounded head. Second thing, the head is facing medially upwards and backward. In short, head should direct it medially. And the third thing, this laser tubercle is projecting from the front of the upper end. So we keep these three points together. The given one is of a left side. Now we discuss the features and the attachment of a humerus. The first we start from the upper end. Now the upper end is having a rounded head. This is the head. The head is articular. It is directed backward, upward and medially. It articulate with the glenoid cavity of the scapula and form the shoulder joint which is a ball and socket variety of a synovial joint. Now this margin of the head this margin of the head is known as an anatomical neck. Now this anatomical neck provides the attachment of a fibrous capsule or a capsular ligament of the shoulder joint except superiorly and inferomedially. Inferomedially it is extended into the shaft of the humerus. Now the second feature, the surgical neck. The surgical neck is the line which separates the whole upper end from the shaft. And the final neck is a morphological neck which lies 0.5 cm above a surgical neck. Morphological neck indicates the line which separates uh, upper epiphysis from a diaphysis. Now the next thing in the upper end is a laser tubercle. So the laser tubercle is a small projection which is projecting forward from the upper end. It receives the insertion of a subscapularis muscle. The second such tubercle is a greater tubercle. This is the greater tubercle. Greater tubercle form a lateral part of a whole upper end. The greater tubercle posterior superiorly it is having three impressions. These are superior middle and inferior impression which receives insertion of supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor respectively. Now in between these two tubercles there is one groove or a sulcus which is known as an intertubercular sulcus or a bicipital groove because it lodges a long head of a biceps brachii muscle. Now, in the bicipital groove, in some lower part, it is marked by a medial lip and the lateral lip, which are a downward continuation of a lesser tubercle and greater tubercle respectively. This bicipital groove is breathed by a transverse humeral ligament and it transmits a tendon of a long head of bicep brachii muscle along with its synovial seat and ascending branch of anterior circumflex humeral artery. Its floor receives the insertion of latissimus dorsi, medial lip receives the insertion of teres major and lateral lip receives the insertion of pectoralis major muscle. You can remember this attachment by a mnemonic lady means latissimus dorsi between two Major. Now we see the feature and attachment of the shaft. Shaft is a roughly triangular in the shape, so it is having a three border and three surface. First, we discuss a border. It is having an anterior border, a medial border, and the lateral border. The anterior border in the upper part it form a lateral leaf of the bicipital group. In the lower part, it is a rounded. And in the middle part, it forms anterior margin of a V-shaped deltoid tuberosity. So this is an anterior border. Now medial border. Now medial border which trace from the lower part. It is very much prominent in the lower part where it forms the medial supracondylar ridge. 
in the middle part it is marked by a rough strip area and in the upper part it form a medial lip of a bicipital group now this in the middle part this rough strip it receives the insertion of a coricobrachialis muscle now last a lateral border lateral border again we trace from the lower part where it form the lateral supracondylar ridge see in the middle part it is interrupted by a spiral groove or a radial groove and in the upper part it is barely traceable up to the posterior part of the greater tubercle of the humerus so these are the three borders now we discuss the surface the first the anteromedial surface which is lies between the medial border and the anterior border in the upper part this me anteromedial surface form the floor of the bicipital group now second surface is a anterolateral surface which is lies between the anterior border and the lateral border now this anterolateral surface somewhere above its middle part it shows the v shaped tuberosity this v shaped tuberosity is known as a deltoid tuberosity and it receives the insertion of a deltoid muscle behind the v shaped deltoid tuberosity this anterolateral surface is drawn by marked by a spiral groove or a radial groove this spiral groove lodges the profunda brachii vessels and the radial nerve now this both the surface anteromedial surface and anterolateral surface in the lower part gives origin of a brachialis muscle now the last surface is a posterior surface this one the posterior surface is lies between the medial border and the lateral border in the upper part the posterior surface is marked by a oblique ridge which gives the origin of lateral head of triceps brachii muscle and the posterior surface in the lower part below the radial groove it receives the origin it gives the origin of a medial head of a triceps brachii muscle this is all about the sac now we discuss about the lower end of the humerus the lower end is expanded from the side to side and it is flattened antero posteriorly it is having a articular part and non articular part first we discuss the articular part it is having a small rounded head shape capitulum facing laterally this head articulate this is known as a capitulum which articulate with the superior surface of a head of a radius forming a part of a elbow joint the next is a trochlea is a pulley shaped articular area which lies on the medial side of a capitulum and it articulate with the trochlear notch of a ulna which also form the part of a elbow joint now see in the trochlea this is its medial flange and lateral flange medial flange is 6 mm downward than the lateral flange this will responsible for a carrying angle which is average 13 degree in adults now we discuss the non articular part of a lower end the first is a radial fossa radial fossa is a fossa which is lies above the capital of anteriorly now it accommodate the head of the radius when you do the flexion of the elbow joint the second is a coronoid fossa coronoid fossa lies above the trochlea anteriorly and it articulate a coronoid process of a ulna in the full flexion the last fossa that lies posteriorly which is known as a olecranian fossa olecranian fossa laws accommodate the tip of a olecranian process of the ulna in the full extension of the elbow joint the next non articular part towards the medially you can see over here there is a large projection this is known as a medial epicondyle of the humerus same way there uh, literally there is a small projection which is known as a lateral epicondyle now above the medial and the lateral epicondyle of the humerus there is a sharp ridge which is known as a medial and the lateral supracondylar ridge
Now we discuss the attachment of the lower end. First, the capsular ligament of the elbow joint. It is attached to the lower end in a such a way that the radial fossa, corona, uh, this capitulum, proclea, coronoid pro, uh, fossa, and the olecranon fossa become intra-articular. So it attached like this, at leaving the littoral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle outside. This is the capsular ligament of the elbow joint. Now. Anterior surface of the medial epicondyle gives the origin to the superficial muscle of the front of the forearm and this point is known as a common flexure origin. Same way the lateral epicondyle gives the origin to the superficial extensor muscle of the back of the forearm. This is known as a common extensor origin. Now the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle gives the origin to the enconius muscle. Now the medial supracondylar rays from its lower part gives origin to the humeral head of the pronator teres muscle and the lateral supracondylar rays from its upper two third give origin to the brachioradialis muscle and from its lower one third it gives the origin to the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle. Now the applied anatomy and some relation of the humerus. First thing, Three nerves are directly related to the humerus. The first axillary nerve around the surgical neck, radial nerve in the radial group, and the ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Now, second thing, the common site of a fracture in the humerus are surgical neck, the middle of the shaft, and the supracondylar fracture. If the fracture occur in the surgical neck, it may damage the axillary nerve. In the middle of the shaft, it may damage the radial nerve. And if there is a supracondylar fracture of a humerus, it may cause, it may compress the brachial artery which is passing the front of the humerus, which may lead to the Walkman's ischemic contracture. Now, the third thing, humerus or a shoulder joint is commonly dislocate inferiorly. If it dislocate inferiorly, there may be chance it, it injures the axillary nerve. The last thing is a carrying angle that we have seen. The carrying angle normally it is a 13 to 15 degree in the adults. If the carrying angle is the more, this condition is known as a cubitus vulgus deformity in which ulnar nerve will get stretched and will lead to the weakness of the muscle of the hand and if the carrying angle is a lace it is known as a cubitus varus deformity so this is all about humerus thank you